Uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's uh, meeting of the Commonwealth Clubs in Forum, Connect, C Connect Your Intellect. You can find us online at commonwealthclub.org slash inforum. I'm Kara Swisher, co-executive editor of All Things D, and tonight we're gathered to present the Inforum's uh, 21st Century Visionary Award to Jack Dorsey, uh, the CEO and founder of Square and the co-founder of a little service you might have heard of called Twitter. Now's our chance to meet him, so let's get started. So, uh, Jack, um, I have not actually interviewed you on stage before. I'm just, just so you know, I'm wearing this. I interviewed the CEO of Twitter recently in Las Vegas, and I wore this outfit with the spangles and the shoes because it was Las Vegas. And he said I was, uh, I was uh, showing a matador chic look. Um, so I'm here. To, this is going to, it made him say a lot of stuff. So I'm going to see if it works tonight. <laughs> um, it's very disarming. So don't stare into the, uh, into my bling too much. Um, so let's start about, not a lot of people, we're, gonna, we're not going to go super techie here, but we can go as techie as you all want in the questions and things like that. But let's talk about how you, let's start with Twitter. Um, talk a little bit about how you started it and what you were thinking when you were doing it. Well, it's, uh, it's a really long story. Yeah, okay. Um, it, uh, it dates back to when I was around eight years old. I just had this... Uh, okay, really long. Okay. Really long What are you, story. like 12 now? <laughs> <laughs> It's good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, uh, so I've always had this fascination with cities and how they work. My parents had, uh, my, my parents grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. They lived in St. Louis, Missouri all of their life and were really big believers in the city. They never moved out to the suburbs. And I just developed this, uh, this fascination um, with how cities worked. And I wanted to visualize them. And I wanted to see them. And I had this obsession with, with maps. And I would collect all these maps of all these different cities. And my, my ultimate city was New York City mm -hmm. because, you know, there's 8 million people and they're somehow all living together and working together and breathing together. And at that time, we got a computer. We got an IBM PC Junior and a, and a Macintosh. Right. And I started um, playing with it. And I realized that it was, a, it was an amazing tool to visualize all these things. And when I was 14, I started getting into programming. And... I got into programming just so I could start drawing maps on the screen. And I learned how to draw some dots on the map, and then I learned how to constrain the dots within streets. And um, then I had all these moving dots around this, this map of New York City or St. Louis, and I thought it was the most beautiful thing ever, but the dots had no meaning whatsoever. And so I had to find this meaning for the dots. And my parents had... What, what were the dots? Just dots? You just the dots were just dots moving around. Um, okay. which was uh, somewhat silly, but I did find meaning for them. And uh, my parents had this police scanner, and I would listen to the police cars go around St. Louis and ambulances and fire trucks, and they would report where they were and what they were doing and where they were going. Right. And those three inputs I could write into my computer program and associate with the dot and then make some calculations, and I could actually see the ambulance move then. And they were all simulations, but suddenly I could see ambulances move and police cars move and fire trucks move, and I could actually see the city. Mm -hmm. And I learned that this whole practice had a name, and it was called dispatch. And so I got into the dispatch industry. Um, so when I was uh, 18, I joined the largest dispatch firm in the world, which was in New York City. It's called mm -hmm. DMS, Dispatch Management Services. And we had these huge screens in this call center um, right next to the Empire State Building. And I could actually see not just emergency vehicles, but taxis and black cars and couriers. And I was like just living my dream. It was, do you have it was any amazing. idea why you were obsessed with the idea of people moving around a city? What was the? <laughs> I have to admit, it's a little odd. It's a little odd. Um, I don't know. I watched a lot of Gilligan's Island myself, but that's neither here nor there. But your dress shows. That. And I'm not on a, on a desert <laughs> island with a, no. a movie star and a rich guy. But go ahead. Um, I don't. I don't know why I was obsessed with them. Um, Still figuring that one out. Okay. I, I've, I'll find the answer at some point. Um, but I, uh, so I, I just kept developing and developing these, uh, these, these systems until I realized in 2001 that I had this rich picture of how New York City was living and breathing. Mm -hmm. it, it was amazing. It was beautiful to me. Did you also do subways and things like that? Because some people yes. are very obsessed with subways. Yeah, yeah. subways and trains, and mm -hmm. I was completely obsessed with trains, um, as are most computer scientists. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of correlation between the two. And um, I realized at that point that I was missing one key element, 
which were the citizens, where were the people. So I had the first BlackBerry, it was the RIM 850, mm -hmm. and I had this little email server, and I was fascinated by a technology called LiveJournal and Instant Messenger, um, ICQ and AOL were getting really big there. And I took the status message from uh, Instant Messenger, which is I'm on the phone or I'm in a meeting or I'm you know, listening to this song, and I wanted to extract that out so that I could update that from anywhere. Right. So I could, I was living in Oakland at the time, and I wrote this little tiny program that would take an email from my RIM 850, my BlackBerry, and it would distribute it out in real time to my friends, to these people on this list. And I thought that you know, they'd be interested, interested in my updates. And I was all excited, and I, I got it finished in, in about uh, 12 hours. I went out to Golden Gate Park here in San Francisco. I went to the Bison Paddock and typed out a message. I'm at the Bison Paddock in San Francisco. I went out to all my friends. And in the first five minutes. In a text, in a text message. In, a, in an email that converted to Did another you? email, because there was no text back right. then. Um, and, I, and I found out that, A, no one cared what I was doing in that moment. Mm -hmm. and B, no one else had this little device, so it was just the wrong time. Right. Okay. Um, but it was the right time in 2006 when text messaging got really big right. uh, in this country. It was the in 2006 was the first time that you could send a message between carriers, mm -hmm. Verizon and Singular. Right. That was the first year. Uh, Europe had had that for 10 years, but we were just getting it. And I was working at a company called Odeo, which was a podcasting company, right. and it was my first real job where I actually produced a resume for? We'll talk about Odeo because one of the things about Twitter that some people know but not everyone does is that it was born out of a failure of another company, um, of this podcasting company, Odeo. How, what got you to California in that? I, uh, so I met... You wanted to do the cable cars? With the, <laughs> they go the same way. They go the same way. Yeah, it's, they're kind of boring. Yeah. Um, so I, I met, uh, at, at DMS, I met this guy who was mentioned, Greg Kidd. Mm -hmm. um, who was the chairman and CEO of that company. And we decided in 2000, 2001, that we wanted to move to California and start our own company, mm -hmm. and um, it to be internet-based. So we moved out here. Uh, and uh, we started that company. It was called DNet. Um, it wasn't a success. We hired 40 people, took $2 million in, in angel funding, and everything at the bu in the bubble was happening at that time. And that was to be do dispatch on the internet? Dispatch, uh, dispatch. dispatch on the web and, right. uh, and bringing uh, specifically around couriers, right. by couriers. Right. Yeah. So you come here, you, you get to Odeo. Mm -hmm. So I get to Odeo and uh, you know, it turns out I wasn't interested in podcasting mm -hmm. and I wasn't interested in building tools uh, with podcasting, but I really appreciated the people that were there. Um, Evan Williams was someone I respected from afar. I, I just liked his style. Mm -hmm. uh, and he created Blogger before this, and he, uh, he was now CEO of this company called Odeo. Right. Blogger was sold to Google, and then he left Google. Then to he left start Google, Odeo. and yeah, he worked with Noah Glass to, to start Odeo, who was the founder of Odeo. And they were bringing more and more interesting people. Um, Biz Stone was, was set to come over uh, mm -hmm. after I joined, so about a month after I joined. And I just wanted to work with the team, and I wanted to do something that was consumer facing, because I had been doing things that were all in the background and dispatch. I wanted mm -hmm. something that my mom could actually use. Right. Um, my mom can use dispatch, but she doesn't know that she's using my system when she hops into a cab in New York City. Right. Um, so that was really important to me. And I, when I joined, I quickly found out that everyone else at the company wasn't a podcaster and didn't care about podcasting either. Oh. Um, so uh, we you weren't- took, what, $5 million, is that right? There yes, some, yeah, right. we weren't really passionate about building the tools uh, that, uh, you know, for the audience that we were building them for. We right. weren't using them every day, and that's, that's always a bad sign, but we had an amazing team there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had amazing ideas, amazing conversations, and that's the, the, the canvas that allowed for an idea like Twitter to be brought up and then to be supported and funded and set off. So Odeo was closed down. Uh, there were lots of, comp I think Apple, there was a, there, it just didn't go anywhere. So a month after I joined, uh, iTunes launched a podcast directory, which right. was our whole business model. Right, right. So, so put you out of business. Put, put, us, put us out of business. It, we, we sort of struggled for like, what do we do next? We looked for group communication and more peer-to-peer -peer stuff instead of podcasting and doing something with, with audio. But uh, we just couldn't come up with anything interesting. And, and meanwhile, we were all using text messaging. And it reminded me of this idea 
that I tried to execute in 2000. The bison paddock idea. The bison paddock idea. Right. What um, happened to that, the, 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 the bison paddock? It's fascinating that these, uh, the revolution in Egypt had started with a bison paddock kind of thing, the use of Twitter. But um, what, what it could, you just kept it off to the side, like, like a novel in a drawer kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, I kept it, I put it on the shelf. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, I still have the code. Mm -hmm. It still works. Mm -hmm. But uh, no one's using it. No one's using it. They're well, using something else. Using so, something you, else. so you took this, how did it get, when you're, you're in this failure, you all return the money um, to your investors? Well, so uh, Ev bought Odeo back from the investors. Right. And uh, in that we were developing... So before, before that, um, we, we kind of all went off to talk about ideas, what we wanted to work on. And uh, a group of us went to the playground, uh, three of us, and I talked about this idea. I said, let's just use SMS. It's very simple. I can update from anywhere, and I can receive those updates from anywhere in real time. And we archive everything on the web, so you can still see it on the web, and you can, you can set the status from the web as well. But it's all one system completely device agnostic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we built a small little prototype in the span of an hour just to show off at the company. Didn't really go anywhere. Um, but then a week later, um, I kept bringing it up. And uh, we got uh, the, uh, the, the mandate to go off and work on it mm -hmm. uh, for two weeks. We had two weeks. And I was the only programmer on it. Okay. And then I convinced. So you got the mandate to go off. I got the mandate to, like, Jack's going <laughs> to go off and Work on this thing. Was it more out of annoyance? Get, Jack is annoying us. And uh, you have to ask about that. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think he. I think he got it. I think uh, Noah got it, and I think uh, uh, Biz was definitely excited about it. So mm -hmm. I got to use Biz Stone for graphical help, mm -hmm. um, and you know he's a he's a great creative designer. Right. And uh, I took one more programmer named Florian, and we got to work. And it took us two weeks, but we had the whole system. And uh, within 10 days, we had uh, the first tweet that we could send out. And the first human written tweet was inviting coworkers, mm -hmm. which was inviting all my coworkers in to, to join in. And it was about, we were about 17 people. Right. What, what did it time. say? Just inviting coworkers. Okay, just inviting coworkers. Mm -hmm. And uh, why the name? What was the name? What was the idea behind the name? We were coming, we wanted a name that evoked a physical sensation. Like when you received a, uh, uh, an update. We we're calling them updates at the time. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that just trails off the tongue. Updates. <laughs> yeah, we weren't, we weren't good at the marketing. It yeah. turns out our users are much better at yeah. that than us. Um, so we uh, we were calling them updates, and when you receive them on the phone, the phone would vibrate mm -hmm. and kind of twitch. So right. we called it jitter, and we called it twitch, and we're like, well, twitch doesn't bring up the best images, so right. we should uh, <laughs> we should not <laughs> we should not do that. Um, and jitter. So. Yeah. Yeah, jitter, jitter doesn't work either. Right. Um, so Noah went to the dictionary. He went to the new Oxford English Dictionary. Mm -hmm. He took Twitch and he went down the TWs and found the word Twitter. Mm -hmm. And the word Twitter means a short, inconsequential burst of information and chirps from birds. We're like, oh, that's perfect. That's right. exactly what we're doing. Right. And, uh, you know, it turns out the domain name was only, I think, $7,000 to buy. Mm -hmm. and Who I've, had it? I've bought it. I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I want to meet that person. Yeah. I once met the person, I was at a party in Silicon Valley, and this sort of disheveled man was at the food table. It was at food.com, uh, which fell wow. apart later. It was another company that sort of went wow. nowhere. And he, I said, what are you doing here? You look like a homeless person eating at the buffet. And he said, I just sold this domain for a million dollars. And I go, go good for you. Nice Speaking work. of disarming. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, so, you, so you, you, you name the thing Twitter. Send name out these the short thing, Twitter, posts. It fits, uh, it fits perfectly with everything we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but we wanted it to be very focused on mobile. Mm -hmm. So we wanted a short code, which is a, a five-digit number that you can send text messages right. to. And uh, so we took out the vowels, and it was T-W-T-T-R to right. start. And that was our name, so that we could fit into this uh, short code, which we were trying to buy. And we found out early on that uh, t uh, teen people on the short code, and they were not going to sell it to us. Right. So we added the vowels back in and became Twitter. Wow. Why didn't teen people want to sell it to teen? Well, why I, did tween, teen people I have I don't know. It? They weren't really using it. Right. Interesting. Sure. Well, all, the, all those updates on uh, Selena Gomez and Justin Bieber. Um, <laughs> Who are so, not born yet. Yeah. Uh, true. That's true. Um, no, they might have been. They, they might have been, been seven. They might have been. Um, so, so here you have this company. What, how did you convince your, the people there to, do, to make this the focus? It just, um, once people, so 
they got that invite and uh, they started getting on it and it became really, really addictive. You could immediately see there was something there. Right. You didn't know what, but there was something there. And the interesting thing is that people in the company, it was just limited to the employees of the company, and then we released it more to our friends and family, and then released it more and more to, to people around the tech industry and around San Francisco. And uh, people started having these conversations on it, and people started inventing new syntaxes on it and uh, replying to each other and addressing each other. Mm -hmm. And it just, you know, every single tweet you would see something new. I mean, one of the first moments that I found really interesting was every time someone feels a jitter in this town, they think it's earthquake. an earthquake. Right. Like if a truck goes by this building right now, right. someone in this room is going to say, oh my God, there's an earthquake and mm -hmm. get up and run away. Right. Or get into the crouching position. Right. And so we, it's good you didn't call it jitter. <laughs> yes. yeah. That would limit us to yeah. earthquakes. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, we saw that on the service, like right away. Mm -hmm. So every time someone felt something, there'd be earthquake. Mm -hmm. And then when there were actually earthquakes, we saw people say, oh, my God, it's an earthquake. And then someone else would say, it's, it feels like a 5.6 out of Berkeley. And then someone else would say, no, 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 it's, it's right next to my house, and it's a 7. <laughs> and then the USGS would get on, and they would say it was a 4.0. The epicenter was in, was in Oakland, mm -hmm. and everything's OK. Right. So it was amazing to watch speculation and, and rumor go to fact in a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. And you could watch all of it unfold in real time. Right. And, and that consumption of the information and of an experience that could potentially be extremely scary, mm -hmm. you had all these people talking about it, right. all giving different perspectives on it. Right. And it just made it feel comfortable. It made it feel more human and it made it feel like you weren't alone. And, uh, and, and that was, that was addicting. Were, were you thinking of that when you, when, the, the idea of an entrepreneurial spark, this idea that you wanted to watch people, uh, dots on a, give meaning to dots on a map, yeah. um, it's more location based and it's more, it's a little different uh, than what you're talking about, but the idea of people expressing themselves, what part of humanity do you think that appeals to? The idea of just people are loud mouthed or they have to say what they're thinking at any one moment? I, I think it really depends on the person. I, I think uh, I, people want to be heard. People want to, people want feedback. People want to know what's going on around them, and they use tools all the time for that. I mean, social networks, by definition, are not new. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's word of mouth, right. and uh, we've transferred it to a technology, um, and the technology makes it faster and easier and and more global. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not new human behaviors. I right. mean, we're looking for information all the time. I'm looking for information around this room, that sign over there, that mm -hmm. clock, mm -hmm. um, you know, someone's facial expression. Right. These are all signals of feedback. And I, I think Twitter is an expression of that. And right. it's an expression that allows us to reach around the world, the person in the middle of Egypt mm -hmm. uh, who can give an, exp an expression or a representation of their expression mm -hmm. um, in real time. And I, in San Francisco, going through my day, can then have a good, a, a strong sense of what's happening for them. So right. it's it's just amazing how small it makes the world feel, the global world and also my world. Right. You know, my family. You know, my my relationship with my family and my mom and my parents and my brothers has transformed dramatically because of Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I get my mom uh, gets all of my tweets and I get all of hers, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> you know she. Uh, you know, I, I update about what I'm having for breakfast. I, right. I do it. And for 99... So you started that. I started, started that. that. <laughs> I, I'm to blame. And for 99... A delicious bowl of oatmeal. <laughs> so tasty. It's, it's useful. Like, except for, like, you know, 99.9999% of the world could care less and thinks it's useless and, and maybe it's even offensive. Right. But my mom cares. Right. She knows that I'm eating. Right. right. <laughs> and when I, when I go traveling, she knows that I've landed. And, you know, that's extremely useful information to right. her. And, uh, and that's the power of Twitter is it's recipient control. Let's talk, we're going to talk a little bit later about what, how that develops. Like yeah. you could also just tweet without meaning to, like that it just tweets for you kind of thing. We'll talk about that going forward where you land and it just yeah. tells yeah. you that you land. More um, one of the things that, that, that Twitter had in its mm -hmm. early days is people didn't really understand it, didn't grasp it, the idea yeah. of what it was doing. And, 
uh, summoned to me, said, I don't get it, it's all this breakfast updates, apparently yours. Um, and, uh, I ate a lot of breakfast. Yeah, and uh, they were like, I don't get it, it's so mundane, it's so stupid. I said, well, what's on the internet? And they said, lots of things. I said, well, do you care what's on the internet? And they're like, no. And I said, well, why do you care what's on Twitter as long as you find what you want? What's the difference? Exactly. Like, it was an interesting, and they're like, oh, yeah, I guess so. I'm like, do you care what's in the library until you find the book? But, but in general, that was the idea is that it was a little, that it, it got this idea of having that, the mundanity, which life is for many, you know, the mundanity of life, but all collected creates. Well, it, makes, it makes everyone more human. I mean, I really appreciate when Barack Obama, when he was a candidate, actually updated and, and tweeted about, uh, about breakfast. Right. And <laughs> it's, it's amazing how we lose he sight of that. He enjoys Lucky Charms with soy milk, <laughs> but anyway. It's amazing how we lose sight of that. Right. It's amazing that we, we forget that someone like him in, in a public spotlight does the same things that we do every single day. Right. And he's human, and we have to remember that. Right. And, uh, and I think that's one of the powers of the technology is it, it makes you know, public figures to the largest organizations, to the largest governments in the world, to the largest social movements in the world, approachable and human, right. and, and remind us that we're all humans and we're all interacting with each other every day. So you left the company for a period, but before that, before we get, you talk about your newest thing, which I think is even more disruptive in many ways, um, talk about what, what it's become from your perspe perspective, how it's morphed into what it's become. Um, how do you look at it now? What do you call it? Because you guys keep changing the, of what it is at some point. Um, what do we call it? We keep, they keep asking me to change. It's a microblogging company. It's a... I don't think it was ever a microblogging company. Okay. What do you call it? Um, that's, that's what's amazing about it. Mini microblogging company? What? <laughs> Nanoblogging. Nanoblogging. No. There was um, a very funny uh, uh, takeoff on Twitter called Flutter, and it only had, what, 24 characters? Yeah. So you could only... You need even less. Yeah, you need even less. Yeah, and then you go... Uh, <laughs> no vowels. There was one no with vowels. no vowels. Yeah. Um, the amazing thing to me is that you ask 100 different people what Twitter is, and you will get 100 different answers. You may get 1,000 different answers, mm -hmm. in fact, for those 100 different people. And that's OK, because the world is different for every single person. And that's OK as well. Um, I think what Twitter is for me right now, and I'm really, really proud of the technology and how it's developed and, and, and how it's you know, really matured, is that it is the entire world in your pocket. I mean, you can carry the entire world around with you. And not only can you consume it in real time, but you can converse with it. You can interact with it. You can, uh, you can mention it, and you can participate with it. And it's all right there on your phone. And it's not just smartphones. It's a $20 cell phone in the middle of Kenya. Mm -hmm. We have a short code in Iraq. We have people in Baghdad. 60% of the population of Baghdad has access to SMS. We have a short code that they can tweet for free, and they can receive tweets for free. That's amazing to think about. They can participate in the global conversation just like we can here in the United States, in San Francisco, with all of our technologies and, 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 and all of our affordances. So how do you get more people? I mean, when I interviewed Dick in Las Vegas, he talked about that a lot of people, most fewer people tweet and more, more people consume. Yeah. And I think, I think he used the word stalkers. Most people are I don't think he used quite that word, but the idea of watchers. Um, of the technology. Is it important that it not only just be that, is people, lots of noisy people, a small amount talking to the rest of the world, or how do you look at that? I think we need to do a much better job at pushing up really relevant information and pushing up that relevant information in real time. There's a lot of people sharing their perspectives and experiences on Twitter today, and, and we need to get better at filtering up the most relevant information, not to the world, but to me. Mm -hmm. to the individual. Because my context, the context that I'm in, is going to change my perspective and my interpretation on what's happening in the world. So I'm currently in, at the Commonwealth Club, and, and there's things that are deeply meaningful to me right now mm -hmm. um, that are not so meaningful to me outside of this venue. And we can tell that I'm, that I'm here. And, and that's very in, in a very interesting way to filter up that information. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we need to get better at making sure that every single time that you open Twitter, it's delightful. And you are seeing stuff that surprises you in a delightful way and seeing stuff that's unexpected and amazing. And we have that today, but it's in all these, these places. And we just need to make it more consistent. We mm -hmm. need to consistently delight mm -hmm. um, across every one of our platforms and, 
and just all the time. Had the focus gotten too much on sort of the big celebrities and Kim, you know, whatever Kim Kardashian happens to be selling at the very at this moment, or you know, the race to, to get more followers? Is that is it because of that the idea of the followers? I think there's ebbs and flows. You know, I, I think in some cases, uh, you know, celebrities are, are huge on Twitter, and then and then you have uh, then you have um, governments fall. And it really depends on what's happening in the world or happening in your world that determines, you know, what's hot right now. But that's, that's what's so amazing about it is it's not just about music. It's not just about celebrities. It's not just about politics. It's about everything. And it's up to the people who are tweeting every day and uh, those people who are consuming those tweets and responding and participating mm -hmm. to take it to the next level. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Egypt and the Middle East. Um, people debated whether it was uh, an important tool or whether it caused it or not. I don't think that's really the point. I think that's people were using point. that. Yeah. People were using it. How do you look at something like that where people were using it rather actively uh, within those uh, revolutions? I mean, I, obviously, it was done on the ground by the people there in protests. But. I mean, it's so, it's so humbling to see. I mean, that, that this technology that just started out as a spark of a small idea. Uh, could be used in this way um, to, to bring up the conversation. I, I think that's the most important thing, is that people were using it on a daily basis and it became an international conversation. And it really allowed for a man on the street account of what was happening. And, and, and these things are so rare, especially from, from you know, cheap devices that everyone can have access to. So mm -hmm. suddenly, you know, what, one of the things that was um, eye-opening to me was actually in Iran. Uh, I, here in the United States, Iran is very much a black box to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about what's happening in that country. And Twitter opened that up. You know, there were people tweeting on the ground and just sharing their experiences and, and talking about what was happening around them, in some cases sharing videos. Mm -hmm. And those videos were just so moving, not only because of what was unfolding, but because there was this country around the world that suddenly we had light into. Mm -hmm. And we could see and we could understand. And I, I think you know, that the important thing for me about technology is that it has those moments where we, we can create a broader understanding of what's happening in the world. And if we, had a, if we have a broader understanding, we have the potential for more empathy. And if I know how someone like Barack Obama lives or someone in the middle of Egypt or Iran lives, then I have an understanding of how, what they have to get through every single day. And that can potentially minimize conflict mm -hmm. around the world. So I think these technologies are extremely important uh, in bringing transparency to the world so that we have an understanding of, of how people live and how to approach them every day. Mm -hmm. Everyone has bad days and, and we also have bad days and you know, we approach people um, based on our moods and we have no idea so, the context for how they're so living. So you're talking about something, a rather big idea about mm -hmm. sort of like the, the, the giant brain of humanity yeah. kind of thing, talking to itself. Yeah. Is that a company or is it something else? How do you look is, at is it? Is it a company? Yeah, is it, you're, you're, trying to, you're also trying to create a company. You've gotten all oh, yeah, this yeah. funding. Um, but, you know, trying to sell tweets from Hertz or whoever, you know, do yeah. advertising and things like that. I think, um, I think, the, I, I think there's a movement mm -hmm. and I think the company supports that movement. It's building a technology that supports that movement, and it, and it makes it easier to, to have that movement. Right. And I, I, think, I think Twitter is best when it sparks that sort of interaction. Mm -hmm. And people always come back to it to find out what's most interesting right now. And it's just a constant feed of everything that you might want to pay attention to. So before we move to Square, what do you think it could become? That people are that it, that's self-aware, um, the, the cell phones are self-aware, or some, you're, you're embedded with a chip of some sort, or um, um. <laughs> I don't know, we tattoo a map on your forehead. I, I, I may love that. I okay. have some tattoos. Really? Uh, I do have some tattoos. Later, he'll be showing them. <laughs> <laughs> I do, too. Do you? Yeah, no maps, though. Uh, we'll compare. Yeah. Um. <laughs> that's in the, uh, the XXX part of the Commonwealth Club. <laughs> anyway. Mine are not that XXX. Right, okay. um, so Oops. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. You should tweet that. No, thank you. Um, it, just, it just has been. Thank you very much. Anyway. I, I think, um, what does it become? I, so I think, you know, Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. I, I think it's, it's at the intersection of every single media and medium. It can point to images, it can point to conversations, it can point to text, to news articles, to video, and it can do so in real time. And 
I think it has the potential to really carry every form of communication. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's quite large. Um, and uh, I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's amazing for the world. So what, what, do you, what would be the thing? Like smell tweets? What? I don't know. Like here, this is what Iran smells like right now. No, I mean, I mean well, you, I don't know. I don't know. The, the, the most amazing thing That's about it. That's not going to happen. Soon. It may happen. Uh, it could but be. Someone's probably right. inventing that right, right now. Okay, all right. Um, I, I think uh, the most amazing thing about it is people define it for themselves every single day. Mm -hmm. And they build new products upon it every single day. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's great. So you left Twitter um, under some tense circumstances, but we're not going to get into that here. But you left and started something else. You're an entrepreneur. Mm. What uh, obsession with maps, location that makes sense for Twitter? What led you to Square? Square. Um, I started with uh, my co-founder Jim McKelvey, mm -hmm. is a uh, is a glass artist. He was my first boss when I was 15 years old, and I've known glass him for artist. a long time. Yeah, he makes. Did you these... make glass? Did you? I didn't make glass, but okay. he was a he was a computer scientist back in the day. But he gave up and wanted to go into glass arts. Okay. So he's created this studio in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I've kept in touch with him, and I started talking to him. Um, and uh, he uh, was calling me, and we decided that we wanted to work together. Didn't know on what, but we wanted to work together. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's, it's recognizing those fortunate situations and, and the right time the teams can be assembled. It's all about the teams. And he, um, he, was, he called me, and he's like, Jack, I, I, you know, I just lost a sale of $2,000 because I couldn't accept a credit card. Mm -hmm. Like this woman was all ready to pay me and all she had was a credit card. She didn't have cash. She didn't have her checkbook. And, you know, for many artists, that means they can't eat, you know, mm -hmm. that they, they can't pay the bills. Okay. And, uh, and here he was, you know, he wasn't in the state because he created this, this studio, but here he was talking to me on his iPhone and I was talking on my iPhone and like we have these general purpose computers next to our ear, mm -hmm. why couldn't you accept a credit card? And we decided to answer the question. It took a month and we built this big card reader um, that plugged into the audio jack of an okay. iPhone. And we wrote some software on the front with a, with a programmer named Tristan. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote the, the software for the, for the back end, the server, and swiped a credit card and generated a receipt and it worked. Um, Which are this punk and big thing. It was, it was huge. Right. Um, but then I went off to all these investors that mm -hmm. I know, and I, and I said, uh, you know, I'd, I'm working on something new, and I'd really love to show you. And they said, oh, I'd love to see it. And I said, do you, do you have a credit card? And they said, yeah, why? And I said, give it to me. <laughs> and, uh, and I would be taking your angel investment right now. <laughs> and I would, depending on who it was, mm -hmm. um, I would type in 50 to $500. Okay. And who got I would, 500 uh, I think it was Ron Conway. Of actually. course. Um, and I would, uh, I would, I swiped his card, and uh, it worked. And he would get a receipt right away. He's like, "Whoa, what? What just happened?" And I said, "Check your statement on on Amex, because you have an Amex." And he went to his phone and he checked his statement, and you know, minus five hundred dollars, Jack Dorsey. Right. Um, <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> "What an innovative way to raise money." <laughs> it was great. <laughs> I, I made over $1,000 just from pitching the company right, alone. Right. Those people who uh, send you emails about uh, Liberia have nothing on you, but go ahead. <laughs> um, so we, uh, we're like, whoa, there's, a, there's really something here. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it really comes down to that, to that demo and seeing something work and, mm -hmm. and seeing someone's eyes light up after it. Mm -hmm. and, and once we saw that, we said, okay, we're, we're making a company. Um, and, and we're going to hire some people. And... Um, and we're going to do it. We had a, we also had a, a naming issue with this one. Mm -hmm. um, we, we decided that we didn't want to work on it, and we were up in uh, Mirror Beach at uh, the Pelican. Who's mm -hmm. been to the Pelican? Beautiful place. Uh, and we were having dinner um, with Greg Kidd again. So um, Twitter was the playground. Yeah, Twitter was the playground. Right. Um, and uh, so you upscaled yourself a tiny bit we, there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the Pelican is not that upscale, but <laughs> a little bit. Better it's than up playground. north. Right. Um, so we went there, and, uh, and we were trying to figure out, figure out a name, and we were driving home. We still didn't have a name, and we were coming up with all, like, naming a financial company dealing with payments is really What were some of the names? Tough. Um, we, uh, Seashell was one of them. Um, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Why? You just looked at the beach, uh, seashells, sand, well, waves. Well, it turns out, like, I'm very conceptual. Okay. Um, 
and seashells were the first human currency. Okay. Um, so we, you know, we wanted to bring that. 5,000 years ago, we were trading okay. value in, in seashells. Okay. Um, so we were looking around Mirror Beach, and uh, I saw this squirrel dart by. Mm -hmm. I'm like, squirrel. squirrel. <laughs> Squirrels go around and they collect acorns from everywhere. Acorn. <laughs> And you can squirrel away That's his money. Next company, Acorn. Acorn. We we had the whole concept. I mean, you could squirrel away money, and you could squirrel mm -hmm. money, and like it worked as a verb, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, but they were rodents, so that, that. But we could get over okay. that. And then we <laughs> we we designed the credit card reader um, to be the, in the shape of an acorn, and you would slide the card oh, through the through okay. the acorn. And right. we actually made the first ones out of wood. All right. It was <laughs> high concept. Um, and then so we were going. We went down to demo it to Apple. And, uh, with the acorn. We had a meeting with, with Scott Forstall and with the acorn. Steve Jobs would throw the acorn at your head, but go ahead and move on. <laughs> and uh, we had this presentation. We had all these like squirrels spread all through the presentation. It was, it was gorgeous. <laughs> and uh, I, I, was, I was having lunch um, before, and, and uh, Scott was taking me through the lunch line. And we go to check out, um, and uh, there was this logo on their point of sale system, and it said Squirrel Systems. And I'm like, oh. what is that? And they're like, well, that's our point of sale system. It's this company called Squirrel, they're in Canada. I'm like, oh, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this part of the presentation is not going to work out. Right. Okay. Um, Did so, you have the wooden acorn, the card reader? Yeah, yeah, yeah we, okay. had the, we had everything. I mean, right. We showed them the squirrels. And you carved it with yourself, like the night yeah, before? We, yeah, we okay. handmade these things, <laughs> okay. um, and All they right. worked. Yeah. Um, so we said, you know, Despite the name, this is really good. Just focus on the technology for now and forget the whole acorn thing. Like the icon was an acorn. There were squirrels all over the application. <laughs> um, it's really bad. So I took a page out of Noah Glass's book. Yeah. And I uh, went down the dictionary. Yeah. And um, found S Q words. You are kidding me. And no. And okay. I found the word square. Okay. And looked at uh, the definitions and I saw a square up, right. which is to settle up. Right. And fair and square, we want right. to bring more transparency to the financial right. world. And we're square, which means we've settled up. Right. Um, and the It also means you're not very hip, but go ahead. That's, we ignored that again. Okay. Okay. The rodent thing, we ignored that. We right. ignored the hipness <laughs> thing. Um, but the concept was just great because it, you know, a square, it's a town square. Mm -hmm. These are the places where people went to worship, to meet, to vote, to sell to buy, these are where our markets were. Mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly what we wanted to do in the world. We wanted to bring face-to-face -face transactions again and focus on offline, real-world commerce. So the name, again, was just great. Plus and the design of Square. It looks better on the iPhone. It does. Than it an does. acorn, I'm guessing. It does, it fits. Yeah. Yes. So it was all thought out before. I would have loved to see you put an acorn in a thing for Steve Jobs. I, he I'll would give just, you ah! one. <laughs> right. I would yeah. like an acorn. Yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't like that. Yeah. So, so the idea was to disrupt payments, so that it wasn't available for small merchants, small, all kinds of small merchants, the it, hot dog vendor, the artist, the, the, spa, the, per, the trainer. The, it was really fo it was focused on the individual. Right. Like People could not accept credit cards, yet 90% of this country is paying with plastic cards. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, there's just a huge imbalance there. Um, so we wanted to, to balance that out and enable everyone to accept credit cards from wherever they are and, uh, you know, see what happens. And uh, what we found out was, I'm digging out my, my square here. Um, uh, so we, we made the thing small and uh, we, we learned how to make hardware and that was something brand new to me and we learned how to uh, relate to banks and that was something new to me. What you do is just this. Yep. Right. That's it. And you can accept a, a credit card. So if you have a garage sale, you can accept a payment uh, for your couch. Um, and you're selling your MacBook, which is $2,000. You can accept a credit card for it instead of asking someone to get a cashier's check or a money order or having them bring $2,000 to the middle of the tenderloin mm -hmm. um, of cash uh, and taking it from them and then giving them the MacBook. You've done that, apparently. I've done that. Okay. <laughs> I've done that back in the day. So were you worried, just as would happen to Odeo with iTunes, that they would stick a card reader in these things? How are you? Because there's a lot of competition now in this space. There is a lot of competition in this space. tomorrow with Google. Um, are you confirming that? Yes, I'm certainly confirming it. <laughs> um, Many people want to get at this idea, and also you can put them in the phones. The idea that these become card readers without yeah. that you swipe a card in front of them in some way. You know, I, I don't. What 
What was important to us was we give these things away for free. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyone can get into this and anyone can use it immediately. And what's important to us is using the tool that you already have in your pocket. Mm -hmm. um, I have a phone in my pocket. It doesn't have a card reader, but I can still take cards. Right. And, and, and I can do so with a free device. And I don't have to upgrade my, all my devices to do that. And, and that's what's important. It's shepherding people from something they know into something new. Right. And, and that's what we're focused on. We, the, the hardware is great, and we love it, and we, we think it's iconic, and, and people remember it, and something that uh, you know, we just love to rally around. But it's really about the software. It's really about the experience and how we can make every transaction feel really special and, and really bring it back to a face-to-face -face consideration. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to go to questions in about five minutes, but what did you, you just announced, explain what you just announced. They just announced a cash register. Oh, this is a, yeah, we're really excited about this. So we, we saw a lot of people use Square on the iPad. Right. And um, we had all this screen real estate. So we could actually build a full cash register, a full point of sale system onto the iPad. And you could create a cappuccino button, hit the cappuccino, and then it would go into this itemized receipt. And suddenly, you go to any cafe here in America that's not Starbucks or Pete's, and you ask them how many cappuccinos did they sell today? They'll be like, I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. And you ask them um, you know, how much they did, they, they can tell you. But they have no data around what they sold. And you know. You run a blog. Um, you use Google Analytics or some analytics mm -hmm. tools very heavily to determine what's good and what, and what people like and what people don't like. Small businesses all over America and me even medium-sized businesses all over America don't have access to that data. They can't make decisions uh, around their business because they don't have the data. Mm -hmm. So this register allows them to quickly ascertain how many cappuccinos they sold today, who, what percentage of those people bought biscotti, what happens on a rainy day, what their hottest day is, what happens on five to seven on Tuesdays. Anyone play Lemonade Stand, the game on the Apple IIe back in math class? There's one person. Um, uh, you know, it's exactly like that. You, you need the data to run a successful business. Every startup, that's true for. So we, we created this register, and we think that will just obsolete all registers, but we went a step further in that we made the register also available in the consumer's pocket. So you, we, we call it card case. And what it is, is it's a lot of people these days are moving away from their wallets mm -hmm. because they're not carrying cash anymore. Right. And they're not carrying all these receipts. They're carrying credit cards. So they, you know, all these uh, upscale brands like Louis Vuitton and Hermes are selling card cases. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you carry around. And we, so we created this card case that has a card for every single one of your merchants. Uh, that you frequent or anyone that you, you go to. And in the same way that you buy with one click from Amazon or iTunes, you store your credit card information once, and then you just one click to purchase, we're taking that same concept and bringing it to every single offline merchant, which still accounts for 94% of commerce in the world. Only 6% of commerce yeah. has moved online. So you can go to your local cafe, you can swipe your credit card once. You download this application called Card Case. It has a card for that cafe. And then when you go back, you open the card up before you get there or while you're online. You hit Open Tab. And then you've opened a tab with that place. You can put your phone in your pocket. You go up to the counter. You order a cappuccino. And you say, put it on Jack. And they select your name from the cash register. Right. And then your card is charged in the background. So you, all of us, Easy. let's just put it on Jack in San Francisco, apparently. Tell them. Don't put it on me. Let's put it on Ron Conway. <laughs> put it on um, Ron Conway. So in that idea, you're running into a lot of big businesses, a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. It's been done a certain way for so long. Are you hoping to just completely disrupt and destroy these businesses? Well, not destroy them. Okay. Um, but we, we, think we, have a, uh, we think we have a solution. I think a lot of what you hear in the payments world today is mm -hmm. everyone is focused on parts. They're focused on coupons or deals or receipts or payments or uh, you know, waving your phone around in the air like NFC, mm -hmm. um, but they're not focused on the whole. You have to focus on both sides of the counter, and you have to focus on the buyer and the seller relationship. 
And it's the in-between that in that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And Square is the only company in the world that is focused on the in-between. Okay. Last question. What really inspires you now in terms of to be an entrepreneur? What's your biggest? Um, I, think, I think the biggest thing is that I just want to use this stuff. That's, I mean, that's, that's really it. I, I, want to, I, want to see, I want to see this in the world. And for Twitter, it's I want, to, I, I want the entire world in my pocket. I want to be able to see Iran in real time. And I want to be able to see what's unfolding in Egypt or in India or in China or in Japan during, during a natural disaster. I want that. And I want to be able to converse with those people in real time and, and learn languages and just be really close to the world. And with Square, I want to go in to a local merchant, someone I, someone I love, like Sight Glass Coffee up at 7th and Folsom, and just enjoy the experience and not worry about bringing my wallet out and putting my credit card down and taking all the receipts and having to throw those away. It's just a mess. I don't want that. I want something that's really clean. And, and I want to not worry about any of that um, conceptual debris. Right. So I just want to use this stuff. What's your next idea? Um, this is enough. He's going to go to the dictionary. <laughs> yeah, gonna... I'll, go to the... I think I'll, I'll write a dictionary. Do you know what? Yeah, that's a good idea. You can do QU next. Right. Let's look down. Like All right, questions from the audience? Let's do, you come up to these things. You don't have to raise your hand. But... Okay. Hey, Jack. Hi. Uh, wow. Uh, so first, I just want to say uh, congratulations. You've had a big week with TweetDeck and Square and the award. Um, so about two months ago, as I'm sure you know, uh, there was an open letter which was published uh, about Square and about its possible security risks with cards giving. Um, so how do you, as you know, founder of a company, I mean, how, how do you deal with that? You know, when this huge company, Verifone, basically comes after you you know, for whatever reason. I Some, think that was a good sign, though, to me. It, I'm nervous. But go ahead. I'll, I'll let you say that. Okay. Um, I, think, uh, I think, number one, what, I, what I'm most proud of, of Twitter and Square, is the companies are really good listeners. And, and they're really open to feedback. And they're really listening to the conversations that, that are happening outside of the company. And I think both companies have a really good sense of pacing around, let's figure out what people are actually asking and how are we how are we addressing this and you know what what elements do we need to hit like is our technology flawed do we need to have plans in the future for this um, how does this affect our partners how does it affect the broader industry and and what are we really trying to say and I think it's important to take time to get that right because it's another it's another product you know, it's another thing that we're telling the world. And to me, that's all product is. It's, it's a story we're telling the world. And it's constantly evolving. And we're, we're putting it on this grand stage, which is the world. Um, and in, in that particular case, you know, the inter interesting thing about Square is that no one's ever done this before. No one's ever enabled individuals all over the country to accept credit cards and, and had it at the ground level. It's always been tightly, tightly controlled. Yeah. So much so that 90% of the people that try, to, that try to accept credit cards, they're denied. They can't accept credit cards. They have to go through this massive process, and it's terrible. So of course, there's going to be some issues, and of course, we need to evolve. And security is one of those things that is constantly iterating and constantly evolving. And we all need to work together to do that. But to answer your question, it's listening. It's coming up with something that makes sense, not only for Square, but for our users and for the industry at large, and then living up to it and making sure that we can really speak to it. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, as a reminder to the audience, um, this program is presented by the Commonwealth Clubs in Forum, uh, Connect Your Intellect. And tonight, we're giving the 21st Century Visionary Award to Jack Dorsey, co-founder of Twitter and founder and CEO of Square. So next question over here. Lemonade stand. I haven't thought of that in 25 years. <laughs> Um, so my question was, uh, you know, what challenges do you guys have marketing it? Um, because, you know, I found out about Square from a fine art photographer friend of mine, and I don't generally have uh, artist friends turning me on to new technology. Um, and once, you know, I saw it from him, I started to see it, you know, really all over the place. 
And so, you know, it seems like you guys did a great job of marketing it, kind of getting the word out about it. And I'm just kind of wondering what kind of challenges you guys had doing that. I think, uh, you know, th the benefit of, of both Twitter and Square is it's really spread word of mouth because people discover the services for themselves and, and they just fall in love with it. And they can't help but talk about it and share it with people. And you can hope, I mean, all you can do is hope for that for any technology, for any company that you're creating. It's, it's amazing, and, and we're very fortunate in that we've, we've been able to create that. Um, I think that the particular challenge that Square has is it's a financial company. It's dealing with people's money. Um, people are very emotional about their money. And uh, it's something that you know, we're, is always top of mind and always something that, that we need to consider as we start to market it and as we start to push it, push it more. But we've been getting a lot of leverage and a lot of runway out of just users talking about it themselves. And, and they're actually talking about it on Twitter. And we're seeing a lot of just pull and lift just from them talking about it and saying, like, you know, I just sold another thing that I would not have normally been able to sell on Square, and they're, and they're doing this on Twitter. Um, so the word of mouth uh, is still very interesting. But we're being, um, we, we think uh, what, what's really interesting is that some of our users are becoming distribution points. We have, there's 5,000 taco trucks in LA, for instance. And each one of them see about 300 people a day. And 30 to 60 of those people have their own business or they want to sell something. And we've shipped 100 to 500 squares to some of those taco trucks to give out when you know, people go up to those taco trucks. And it's free. And the other thing is, you know, we have them being sold in the Apple stores today. So all 235 Apple stores in the United States are selling squares, and you buy one for $10, and you open it up, and there's a redeem code, and we give you the $10 back, so it's still free. Um, but it's an it's amazing placement and, and somewhere that people are going to naturally. Um, and we'll have more and more locations like that in the future. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm curious about your reaction to the um, recent Fortune cover story about Twitter that, you know, really seemed to paint a picture of, you know, at least at the top, a lot of disarray, infighting, backstabbing. Curious, you know, your thoughts. Obviously, you know, you've been a phenom for a while. Now you're starting to get, you know, some of that critical coverage in the media. You know, the I dead bird was a nice touch. <laughs> It was a bird on crutches. Oh, sorry. It wasn't dead. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think um, Twitter has always been under a microscope, and it's always had a lot of attention. And there's always a lot of speculation from the outside, and it's easy to speculate because you're always seeing different things, and people interpret them in different ways. But internally, it's not that difficult and it's not that complex and it's just like any other human relationship. Yes, there are good times, yes, there are bad times and there's everything in between, but we're running a company of 500 people and you know there's going to be bumps in the road. And I think, you know, the, it's a testament to any company to get through those. And it's also it's also a success that we have an article written like that because you know the world is watching and the world cares the world cares that we're we're around this is very good spin <laughs> what it means we're doing well okay it means well i would uh, i would it I might point out well. that years ago there was a cover story called chaos at google right when they got started it was really and there was a similar one about facebook about facebook too. which was interesting but at the same time you are the most over sherry blabby culture i know of in silicon valley they tend to over talk about all their problems we, do. we need to stop that yeah yeah they're they're a very it's a very sherry company we are you're not yeah. very locked down so everybody feels they can comment well we, we have a lot locked down yeah do you <laughs> <laughs> jack is putting the hammer down <clears throat> Hello, Jack. Uh, one of the most disruptive aspects of Square is the fact that it frees merchants from having to rely on getting their own merchant bank account. For anyone who's ever tried to create yes. uh, their own online business, they know what a pain in the butt it is to actually get one. Um, so I'd like to get your thoughts on Square and other companies like Bank Simple's ability to change this monolithic industry, which hasn't changed mostly in about 50 years, has been really you know, resistant to change. Yeah, you know, we started Square, and, and there's no better time to start a company than in a depression or a recession because the slates have been cleaned. And 
uh, you know, we, we took advantage of all the chaos going on in the market at that time. And uh, we, we could walk in the door to Visa, who's right up the street, um, trying to forget where, I'm forgetting where we are right now. Um, and we, we showed them what we had, and, and they loved it right away. They're an and investor. They're an investor. And, and we walked into uh, Chase, who is also an investor and a partner, and we showed them right away. And because, because the crisis happened, they were looking for new things, and they were looking for new models of being. And now the entire, th the, the entire financial world is open to more innovation. I think that's a really good thing for, for entrepreneurs. I think it's a really good thing for the world. Um, and I think it's really good for our economy. And uh, that's, that's something we're focused on a lot. We, we think Square will have a dramatic impact on the economy uh, in the positive because it allows and enables more and more people to participate in the economy, in an economy that was out of reach to them before. And that's you know, a, a story that we tell Visa, that's a story we tell all the financial institutions that we talk to, and they're thrilled with it because it means more usage of their products. And we hope that we inspire them to be more transparent. That's our lofty goal is, you know, we're leading the way in terms of really opening up this, this world. And we would love for you, our partners, to, to follow in, in this light. And we've learned a lot from you, and, and it's, it's awesome. But, you know, you can also learn from us. And, and that's our ask. And, and they've been really open to that. Although and, uh, one, would, one might argue that your biggest enemies would be the, pho the Google and Apples of the world who, could want, who want this business yeah. kind of thing for themselves. Let's uh, ask Thanks. questions quickly because we only have a few more minutes. I don't Hi, think Jack. we're going to get to everyone. I, I'd like to know more about the long-term vision of Twitter. So you mentioned you want all forms of communications on Twitter. So years from now when there's like a billion users on Twitter and it's much more absorbed into the culture, what's like a, a new form of communication you can see? coming out of Twitter? Well, I think the, I think the first thing is, is it really goes back to that, that world, you know, the world being in your pocket. I think uh, that, that is the long term. We've never had that before in, in, in civilization. And, and that's huge. That, that's a huge vision for us. And, uh, and we're going to do it. And, and we'll be the only company that, that can do that. But you know, I, think, I think we can do even more. Um, I think we can, uh, that, that relies a lot on consumption. But there's even more in terms of sparking interaction. And that interaction can happen physically. It can happen over other mediums. Um, it can happen over other devices. And I think what Twitter is really, really good at is it fits into your life naturally. I have people that I follow over SMS, my mom being one, who they're delivered right to my phone. And it interrupts my day. And, and she's someone that you know I enable to interrupt my day. And I'm just saying that because I'm on camera right now. Um, <laughs> and I have to. But it's true, Mom. Um, and, uh, but others I want to consume on my iPad or on my TV or on my computer. And, and that's OK, too. So Twitter can follow you around and, and fit into your life in a relevant way. And, and there's, a, there's a long way to go there to, to make that technology better and, and more relevant. And, and that's, you know, that's what we'll be working on. Very quick. Cause we have just Hi, Jack. Two um, so you mentioned how you came up with the names for both companies, and that you guys were able to get Twitter for 7K. Is there any reason why Square is still not Square.com, and is there <laughs> plans for that? Um, <laughs> what is that people, team well, people again? No, <laughs> uh, no, a, a bigger franchise. Uh, you ever heard of the game Final Fantasy? Right. Oh. So uh, it's a company called Square Enix. Um, they own Square.com. Unfortunately, they're not doing anything with it. Uh, if you go to, if you type in Square.com right now, it, it, it doesn't resolve. Um, so we have uh, SquareUp.com. It's, uh, if, if you're out there listening, we'd love to uh, make you an offer. It's an injustice. Uh, one, uh, unfortunately, one last question, then I have to ask one final one. Okay. One of the reasons that Groupon Sorry. has uh, become so popular and successful is because they've hired a direct sales team uh, at the local level. So I'm wondering what you guys are doing at Square are you hiring a big sales team, local sales team, or are you trying a different approach? We're, we're evaluating that in real time. You know, we, we're getting a lot from word of mouth. We're getting a lot from these distribution points that we've set up. Um, and I think we need more of a, a sales team when we go into larger retailers. Uh, and, and, and that's the right time for it. But we're, we're not there yet 
um, because they're just doing so many things that we don't want to get into just yet. So Jack will be available. Sorry, we don't have time, unfortunately, because we have a time concern, but he'll be available later if you can ask any questions. So um, there's a question out there about who would play you in the Social Network movie, the version of it. Um, and as opposed to Mark Zuckerberg, you got Jake Gyllenhaal, Patrick Dempsey, uh, some very <laughs> handsome dudes. Um, well, I'm, I'm honored. Yeah. Well, it's not in, in Silicon Valley. The competition is not very. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> This is, I'm going to call, I'm going to name him the Brad Pitt of Silicon Valley. Um, so they're asking all the speakers um, at the Commonwealth Club the question, uh, Jack, what is your 60 second idea to change the world? Huh. Right. Um, uh, if you give me sex, 60 seconds, I'll go back and work on the, on the two of them. Okay. Any of them? Any, the two Both ones you're them. doing? Square, Square and Twitter. I, I, think, uh, I, think they're, I think they're changing the world uh, every, every minute. I thought you'd say you're going to solve cancer, but okay. Um, excellent. Uh, everyone, let's give a big round of applause for Jack. Thank you. Uh, and um, I'm going to let you do this. Uh, now, now this meeting of Inform uh, and the Commonwealth Club is adjourned three times. Excellent. Thanks.